catch you now, Ken. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, good afternoon to everybody, or should I say good evening to um, everybody joining in. I know it's a beautiful evening and I expect you will be in your garden. And if you're on your smartphone, even better. And with one eye on the football, possibly, but you're allowed to do that. It's the second of the events that's on this evening. The first being, of course, the Chase House of Glasgow Business Lecture. And it's a warm and indeed a very warm uh, welcome to the Chase House Business Lecture which has been delivered this year by Professor Eleanor Shaw, Associate Principal at University of Strathclyde. Now, before I say a bit more about Eleanor, can I just remind you that she will be able to take questions at the end of the lecture. So if you want to use the chat facility or the Q&A facility on, on the Zoom bit at the bottom of your screen, please do so. And I'll be happy to take those questions for Eleanor. So another big welcome, Eleanor, to you. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to you for taking on the task of the business lecture. And it's a great shame that we still have to use the Zoom webinar system. We had hoped that we'd be able to um, furnish the, the Strathclyde Lecture Theatres in all our glory, but we're not able to do that yet again. So here we go with the Zoom. Um, Eleanor graduated with an MA and PhD from University of Glasgow. And after a brief spell in financial services, she's been working in the university sector for more than two decades. She's a professor of entrepreneurship and has worked at various universities here in the UK, as well as in North America, South America, Europe and New Zealand. Her research on women's entrepreneurship has been influential in both Scottish and UK government support for female entrepreneurs. Her work on social entrepreneurship has been very highly cited and she is recognised as one of the first entrepreneurship scholars to explore this important sector. She was director of the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship for six years and from this excellent organisation she moved to the um, Shaka University and in her current role she is responsible for the university's entrepreneurship strategy branded as Strathclyde Inspire. As we cast our eyes towards what we can expect from the new normal post-COVID, I am sure Eleanor will offer some compelling thoughts this evening. So Eleanor, over to you, all the very best to you, and I'll speak to you again after the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken, um, for such a, a warm welcome. I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, clearly, when Ken and I agreed on the date, uh, we, we hadn't really given much thought uh, um, to the Euros, but we should have known that, that quite often around about this time of year, the weather is very good. Um, so I promise you, um, we will have you off of here um, in, in time for what we are predicting might be a penalty shootout, um, which could be quite exciting. So so let, let's see what happens there. Um, now, I'm very aware of the history of Glasgow Trades and Glasgow Trades House, and I'm honoured to have been invited to speak with you. Um, I've done a bit of research and I can identify quite a few similarities between Glasgow Trades and the University of Strathclyde. Both were established during significant periods in our history. Glasgow Trades in 1605 during the Scottish Reformation and Strathclyde in 1796 during the Scottish Enlightenment. Both were challenging, vibrant, exciting, and of course, uncertain times. And I suspect that given the constant state of flux in which we currently find ourselves, we can, we can learn much from the richness of our respective histories. So to the title of, of my talk, this was inspired from a conversation that Ken and I had several months ago, um, certainly well before I started to plan um, and research uh, for this evening. So please do, uh, grant me a little bit of, of license if I go slightly off topic. So much has happened since, uh, and I've tried to pull, pull together a talk for you this evening um, that is really contemporary um, and, and takes account of our current situation. It's unavoidable not to. Um, as Ken said during his very kind introduction, 
I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Strathclyde. And in that role, um, I've been really honored to have been able to work with many amazing small firms and entrepreneurs for about more than 25 years. As part, as part of Strathclyde's commitment to the Scottish entrepreneurial ecosystem, through my work on our Growth Advantage Programme, our Innovation Advantage Programme and Productivity Through People, I've had the opportunity to work with many of Scotland's fastest growing firms, helping them navigate the many and various routes, routes to growth and prosperity. So for tonight's talk, as much as I'm going to draw upon my experiences um, of research and, and make use of the research that's available to us, I'm also really drawing upon my experiences of working with fantastic entrepreneurs that I have learned a lot from. Um, so now that the introductions are out of the way, let's talk about the new normal. What does it look like and how might a focus on innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship help us navigate our unfolding future? So it's impossible to start this um, talk without acknowledging the presence and the impact of COVID. So let me say a little about that. Recent figures from the Fraser of Allender show that the Scottish economy grew by just over 2% in March of this year, but the economic output remains about 5.5% below pre-pandemic levels. And this is slightly better than the UK figure, which stands at about 5.9% particular to Glasgow, I've pulled a couple of figures here that I think are, are relevant to us. If we look at furlough, it's unsurprising um, that, that, that Glasgow has one of the highest furlough rates. At the end of April, approximately 33,000 jobs in Glasgow were furloughed. And of those, 50%, unsurprisingly, were in retail, accommodation and food services. Now, the good news is, most recently, in fact, just last week, the Fraser reported a significant rise of close to 50% in the accommodation and food services share of trading all across Scotland since March. So clearly, the rollout of the vaccine and the move that Glasgow has had down to level two is starting to have an impact in those really important parts of um, the city's economy. Um, looking at employment rates, um, Glasgow City currently has a rate of around 70%. That's a little bit below both the Scottish and the UK average, which sit at respectively around 74 and 75%. Um, if we look at the claimant rate, um, again, um, for, for Glasgow, if we look at the, the period over March 20 to March 21, Glasgow City has experienced the largest inc increase in claimants um, at about 4%. The Scottish average is 3%, but that's unsurprising given the size of Glasgow. What it, what's a bit more puzzling for us is if we look at figures for qualifications, um, on the one hand, just short of 13% of the population of Glasgow City have no, no qualifications at all. That's really quite high compared to a Scottish average of 8% and a UK average of 6.6. In contrast to that, 51.6% of the population in Glasgow is educated to at least degree level. So that's above a Scottish figure of 49% and substantially above the UK figure of 43%. So sure, the city has a number of great universities um, which attract fantastic talent that likes to stay on in our city um, after they have graduated, but that's not quite enough to explain um, what's going on there. What is concerning is the disparity there amongst those who have education and qualifications and those who have not. Those sorts of disparities are key determinants for what we know um, is something that's been called the Glasgow effect. The lower life expectancy and the poorer health of Glasgow residents relative to the rest of the UK, relative to the rest of Europe. And of course, across Glasgow, we see significant disparities in health, well-being, employment, education and mortality. Um, According to postcode, for example, 
at birth, there is a 15 year gap in male life expectancy. And that's at birth before anything, before a person has even done anything, according to where you live within Glasgow. And the figure for women stands at 11%. So those are quite some quite compelling figures. Another figure I want to share with you are the percentage of children in low income families. This particular economic outcome is largely regarded as the very best indicator of how well an economy is going. And normally, um, areas that have high levels of income per head have the lowest levels of child poverty. That's the lowest levels of children living in low income households. Unfortunately, Glasgow bucks that trend. It's done so for quite some time. Um, so within Glasgow, 34% of children are living in, pover in poverty compared to 15% for Eastern Bartonshire and 16% for East Renfrewshire. That figure is also higher than Dundee, which stands at 28%. Edinburgh 22 and Aberdeen at 17. So that Glasgow effect um, is concerning because it's enduring and it seems to be a really sticky problem that we're, we're not tackling perhaps as many of us on this call this evening would like us to be, to be having some success over. And um, if we look at future forecasts, forecasts are quite frankly, not quite all over the place, but they're varying. So the Fraser of Allender um, has actually got a more positive um, forecast this month. It's predicting economic growth um, uh, is, will go up from 3.6 to 5.9% for 2021. And they now expect that uh, the Scottish economy will return to pre-pandemic levels by the summer of 2022. That's three months earlier than their, the forecast they made in March. In contrast to that, the Scottish Fiscal Commission sees a, a different pattern of growth. They see it quite low for 21, at about just low, less than 2%. And then they see it rising to about 7.5% for 22. And the Office for Budgeting Responsibility suggests a similar pattern for the UK. So despite those varying patterns, what we know is that once the UK government's job retention scheme winds down, there's going to be really difficult decisions that we need to make about the labour force, with most estimates suggesting that unemployment, the, the unemployment rate is going to rise to above 10%. And also that at least in the short to medium term, new job opportunities are going to become rare. Um, so what that means is uh, in the short, the short term, Glasgow, like most other economies, may have a pretty tough time but we've got some great institutions in Glasgow there's a fantastic um, uh, strategy for inclusive growth that is going to help us out of that what worries me more actually are the enduring inequalities that span the city and COVID has brought those into really sharp focus uh, and it's likely that um, those are going to get worse and I'm concerned because we don't seem to be making much of an input there. So I wonder if it might actually be easier for us to recover out of COVID than it may be for us to address those enduring inequalities. And so my first link to entrepreneurship then, I, I strongly believe that innovation, creativity and entrepreneurial leadership, different ways of thinking, are what we need to address the deep-rooted economic and social inequalities that we know span across our city. So let's have a look outside of the economy and economic indicators of what other drivers are there in the new normal. Now, in his book, The Sun Also Rises, Hemingway has a character, Mike, and Mike has become bankrupt. And he's asked to explain how, how did that happen? And to quote Mike, he says, well, there are two ways to become bankrupt. Gradually, you almost don't notice it, and then suddenly. Now, the same might be said about how our world is changing and why we're entering a new normal. COVID has brought into sharp focus pre-existing trends and 
as well as highlighting those trends, it's also accelerated the reach and the impact of those trends. The North American scholar and civil rights campaigner Kimberly Crenshaw discusses this in her latest uh, collection of edited essays. Um, in her new book, she argues that um, COVID has not created the stark social, financial and economic inequal inequalities that we see globally, but rather that COVID and COVID related restrictions have really made these inequalities much more visible right now than at any other moment in our recent history. So I've had a look at some of the trends that were present before COVID and most likely have accelerated since March 2020. And I want to talk about those trends. Clearly these trends are interrelated interrelated and they are difficult to unravel and disconnect from one another but I'm going to try to and as I talk through these trends what I'd like you to bear in mind is I'd like to propose that different ways of thinking that more creative ways of thinking more innovative solutions and better more impactful entrepreneurial leadership will be essential if we're going to harness the opportunities that are being created by these trends and respond to them in ways that create more and more equally distributed economic, social and environmental prosperity. So let's have a look at these trends. The first one that I want to talk about um, are changing buying habits and implications for our high streets and city centres. Um, now, <laughs> If, like me, any of you on the call tonight grew up around about the same time as me, don't you remember there was a Woolworths on your high street, there was a BHS, and there was a Malcolm Campbell. And if you're a little bit young, younger, there was definitely a Top Shop and a Debenhams. So if you remember any of those shops, then you too will have observed changes that are happening on our high streets and recognise that those changes have been happening for quite some time. Not since, not during COVID, but long before that. What we do know is that COVID has accelerated those changes. Um, there's some evidence that suburbs and smaller towns have fared better than city centres, but the long-term trend is a move away from high streets as retail destinations. Um, sadly, even grand shopping streets like Buchanan Street aren't able to buck that trend. And, and it's really sad to see that happening. Um, some recent figures that I can share with you from the Scottish Government and the consultancy firm GHD, and, and that's not GHD, the hair straighteners, it is the, the consultancy firm GHD. They've used analysis um, of spending using credit card transactions within Scottish cities. And that analysis shows that Glasgow is the city that has been most badly affected since COVID. The annual total spend between 2019 and 2020 within Glasgow dropped by 16%. That's worrying because when we contrast that with other cities, spending in Dundee grew by 6%. In Stirling, it grew by 4%. And in Perth, it grew by a whopping 19%. So this really brings into sharp focus um, the, the transient nature of spending within Glasgow and the fact that people travel to work in Glasgow and when they do so they spend money in Glasgow and when they're not traveling they're going to spend money elsewhere likely in the towns and the cities that they live. So what might we do about this? There's a really interesting recent article in Prospect magazine that talks about reimagining high streets, not as centres of um, retail, but as centres for civic engagement. So imagine a high street that would offer befriending services, cooking classes, access to lifelong education, advice about how we as individuals can be more sustainable. A high street that has social housing right on the high street, that has access to art and even communal gardens. So it's a really different way of thinking what we mean by high streets and city centres. This type of thinking is happening right here in Glasgow. Um, 
and I'm talking about Postle Park here. Uh, Postle Park uh, has faced a lot of challenges since uh, the 1960s because a major employer um, closed down. Uh, but more recently, um, it, it has introduced as a pilot a community improvement district rather than a business improvement district. And what that community improvement district is doing is really engaging in amazing innovative thinking. Um, it's thinking about what can it do uh, beyond the commercial viability of Postle Park? How can it adopt a community-centred approach that really thinks about the well-being of its residents and how the high street can help um, create an environment that enhances the well-being of its residents? Um, to achieve that, the, the 90 plus local businesses that exist in that area are working with community groups, charities, churches, and most importantly, with those living in that area that have a long-term interest in the stewardship and the curation of the place where they live. So I think I'd like to propose to you that if we're going to reimagine our high streets as civic centres rather than as predominantly retail places, we need to think about it differently. And you'll not be surprised for me to say we need space for creativity, innovation, entrepreneurial thinking to reimagine how we can make that happen. The second driver I'd like to speak about is the changing world of work. So most of us <laughs> have felt the swift and dramatic changes of how we work as a consequence of COVID. Overnight, many of us became home workers. We'd no training in how to work from Zoom. We'd little grasp of how to use Zoom or how to use Teams. I, I can see Emily is, is joining us tonight. I, Emily had to guide me through how to make best use of, of Zoom um, because we wanted to stay at home to save the NHS and to help others. Now, while for many of us, that was a really dramatic change, the reality was that COVID has accelerated drivers for greater flexibility, agile working, and better work-life balance. And it's unlikely that we're going to return to a pre-pandemic normal. And if that's the case, we need to think about how we as leaders, as employers, make the new normal work for our employees. And, and how do we create amazing workplaces that really um, provide economic prosperity and cherish the well-being of employees. So last week, the CIPD released a report called Working Lives Scotland. This is a survey of job quality in Scotland, and it provides a window into the current state of work in Scotland uh, by measuring five dimensions of fair work, respect, security, opportunity, fulfillment, and effective voice. Uh, and the report argues that significant shifts to home working as a consequence of COVID are exposing deep differences in job quality across Scotland. So let me share one or two of, of these with you. Uh, what the report has found, this is really interesting. For those of us who are now working at home, paradoxically, we feel that we have better relationships with work and with our colleagues at work, even though we're not seeing them, and also that we have a more positive voice, so we're, we're listened to more at work. However, we also are reporting challenging work-life balance issues and excessive workloads. So, for example, 37% of people who work fully from home say they find it hard to relax in their personal time, and that's because of their job. And 40% of those working from home are reporting excessive workloads. What's also quite concerning is that more than 25% of those involved in the survey, so those are people working at home and also not working at home, um, feel that their work is negatively impacting on their mental health. So this really opens up um, a can of worms, if you like, for us as leaders, as organisations, we need to think about how we address these mental health and well-being 
issues because if we don't do something about them now, who knows what's going to happen in the future? And again, you won't be surprised. We need innovative, creative, entrepreneurial responses if we're going to do that in a really impactful, effective manner. So that takes me to my third driver, um, which is well-being. And I wanted to pull this out in particular, as I strongly believe that workforce well-being has been brought into really sharp focus over the past 16 months. Leaders and organisations have had to scrutinise their well-being practices. And they've had to really think hard, and it's been difficult, about how they can better support the well-being of their workforce, including the mental health of their employees, regardless of where they're working. Now, Gallup has a recent report that also just came out this month called The State of the Global Workplace, and it offers some interesting and indeed worrying insights. This is an annual survey that's been running since 2005. It has been collecting data from individuals aged 15 and above from 160 countries. And it typically um, will have a minimum of a thousand responses per country. For larger economies, it will be more than that. For smaller, it will be less. What those um, findings tell us, and there's, there's lots, I'm only going to give you the headlines here, globally, 70% of employees report they're struggling or they're suffering rather than thriving in their overall lives. So not just their work lives, their overall lives. The next figure for those of us uh, as leaders of organizations, this is worrying. 80% report they are not engaged and they are not actively, I'm sorry, they're not engaged or they are actively disengaged from their work. And Gallup estimate that over the past year, globally, this lack of engagement, engagement has cost 8.1 trillion US dollars, which is almost 10% of global GDP. So that is a whopping figure. But what Gallup made clear is that this trend has not come about simply because of COVID. This longer term trend of rising levels of poor mental health amongst employees, which devastate people and their families and puts a damper on productivity, creativity and innovation is something that's been around for quite some time. Now, organisations are recognising this challenge and, and they, they're beginning to recognise that they cannot solely rely on resilient individuals to help companies maintain good workplace well-being. Um, instead, growing numbers of organisations are recognising that they too have a responsibility to care for the well-being of their employees. Um, now, <laughs> the final figure I want to share with you from GAP, uh, Gallup is, is this one. Um, they looked at levels of employee engagement uh, for all Western European economies and it's down and I quote it's dismally low around only 11% of Western European employees so that includes the UK report that they're engaged with their work that is highly problematic because multiple research papers demonstrate the positive relationship between high levels of employee engagement and high levels of productivity, innovation, better safety, better financial performance. So this is a real challenge um, for, uh, for our organizations and for our leaders. So what can we do about this? Because ultimately, workplace wellbeing is dependent upon the leaders of organizations. So what we're gonna have to do as leaders of organizations is something different. We're going to have to approach well-being, you see a theme coming here, by more creative, innovative, entrepreneurial mindsets, because if we don't do that, we're going to have a large-scale mental health issue amongst our workforce. The fourth driver I want to talk about is diversity and inclusion. Now, this is not a new consideration for leadership, but COVID has had a disproportionate impact 
on the most fragile people within society, on women, ethnic groups, those in the most poorly paid jobs, those with disabilities, those who the youngest and also the oldest. And it is this is really COVID is really challenging any progress that we've been making in this area. But but let me speak about progress. It's modest. Before COVID, the gap between male and female employment rates in the UK was the lowest since it was first recorded in 1971. Yet, before COVID, uh, if you take the FTSE 100 chief execs as an example, many more of them were likely to be called Dave or Steve than they were to be called Eleanor or Fiona, suggesting that male and female experiences of workplace progression are not equal. Women are in workplaces, but when we look at the FTSE 100 sample, very few of them are chief executives. Worse still, um, the CPID estimate that if we look at current rate of progress uh, with the same group of companies, we are not going to meet targets for ethical diversity on boards until 2066. So 2066, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, people mag people um, management have reported that not a single executive or a senior manager at any UK top listed company, so again, FTSE 100 companies have disclosed that they have a disability, although a small number did prefer not to say. That report also found a lack of support for disabled people with just 5% of FTSE 100 companies having board level statements on disability as part of their leadership agenda. So it's not looking great. We, we're making, you know, we think we're making progress when it comes to diversity. And then we look at those figures and you think, oh my goodness, we're not making progress at all. And that's a real shame because the business case for diversity has been made over and over and over again. The more diverse a workforce is, on every single metric, the better an organisation will perform. And I don't just mean financial, I mean workforces will make better, bolder decisions, especially in a crisis. Diverse workforces are shown and, and are known to be more radically innovative. They are better able to anticipate shifts in the market and the consumption patterns, and they're much better at helping their companies remain competitive. So it's really curious as to why um, we're not doing as well when it comes to diversity. Um, one reason that is suggested is that actually what goes hand in hand with diversity is inclusion. But how inclusive are our workplaces? Um, recent figures suggest they may not be as, inc as inclusive as we would want them to be. So, for example, the Government Equalities Office, um, they conducted a survey recently of 100,000 um, LGBT employees in the UK. And that survey found that 23% had experienced negative or mixed reactions from others in the workplace due to them either being LGBT or being thought to be. Um, more broadly, CIPD Working Lives Matter survey has found that 22% of employees feel that other team members judge them and many others as being different and treat them differently. So perhaps before we tackle diversity or hand in hand with that, we need to think about how we can become better, more inclusive um, organisations. And I have a brilliant example to share with you. I don't know if any, any of you have heard of an organization called the Human Library. If you haven't, please Google it and have a look at them. It was set up in 2000 in Copenhagen by two brothers, eh, Ronnie and Danny Abergill. And the purpose of the Human Library is to challenge our unconscious biases, our prejudices, and to encourage us to question the stereotypical views that we hold about other people who are different from us. So in the same way that you would borrow a library, the human library will connect teams to individuals who are unlike them. This might be because they are transgender, it might be because they have a disability, 
Um, it, it might be because they speak a different language, whatever it might be, and that person is a book. And what the, what the Human Library does is work with companies to help them understand where their biases lie and what and how they can then move beyond that to be much more inclusive. Now, in the UK, Heineken were the first company to work with the Human Library and through them, numerous other UK organisations are now working with them and they're using the Human Library for diversity and inclusion training. This spans from, on the one hand, Tesco to the Church of Scotland at the other. So there's an amazing range of um, organisations now working with the Human Library. Now, I can also see on the call this evening, my colleague Roddy Yar is here. So Roddy, I'm, I'm now going to talk about the fifth driver, the, the environment. Roddy's the expert on this. So if I get anything ro wrong, Roddy, keep me right. Um, the civil rights activist Jane, James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Now, I like that quote. I think it's really apt at describing how governments, organisations, institutions, households, individuals think about sustainability. And again, COVID has really shown a light on this. It, it, and what's interesting is, on the one hand, COVID restrictions have shut down travel. And on the other, tech advances have allowed us to engage in more interaction, more international collab collaboration. And that's really, really flourishing. So when you bring those two together, think about the environmental savings that are made and the well-being gains that we're actually reaping by not having to travel all over the world for really short periods of time. Um, so issues to do with the environment and sustainability are here to stay. And this is not new. Extreme weather events have been impacting globally, globally for a long time, well before COVID. And what we know is that there's probably three different types of organisations. There's organisations that for quite some time have been thinking about the environmental performance and they've been doing that in earnest. There's others who haven't given it that much thought. And there's a third group who are keen to do something, but they're not quite sure what to do. Um, there are clear business benefits for responding to the environment. Employees are telling their employers, that their organisations, that they want them to be greener and customers are demanding more and more impactful sustainability strategies. Um, they've had enough of greenwashing and they are demanding better environmental, social and governance credentials. Um, given the scale of this challenge, no one organisation alone can, can address this and it's fantastic to see genuine collaboration on a global scale happening. Collaborations like the UN-backed Race to Zero, which has so many cities, countries, businesses um, committing um, to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. It, it's just amazing. Um, the UK, as a member of Climate Ambition Alliance, is part of Race to Zero, as are, within the UK, the IOD, Chamber of Commerce, 30 of the UK's uh, FTSE 100 companies, including AstraZeneca, BT Group, Sainsbury's, Unilever, and many of them have committed to net zero before 2050. Um, in Scotland, recent amendments to the Climate Change Act have committed the Scottish Government to achieving a target of net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases slightly earlier by 2045, and our great city, Glasgow, um, through Sustainability Glasgow, has made a commitment to make the city net zero carbon by 2030. Um, this partnership of public, private organisations, including universities, aims to position Glasgow as a leading city in the development of the green and wider circular economy. With our city hosting COP26 later this year, we've got a fabulous opportunity to, show, to showcase our authentic commitment to net zero. And beyond November, if we can match the ambition that we have to achieving those net zero targets with investment in creative, innovative, entrepreneurial approaches to achieving those targets, Glasgow will be in a great position 
to reduce carbon emissions locally and to share and celebrate that success globally, um, encouraging others as to how they did it. The, the final trend that I want to speak about is purpose and the power of why. Um, clearly, our workplaces are encountering transformational shifts in how we work and how we define success. And it's unlikely that going forward, the performance of our organisations will be measured on profits alone. Many organisations are already committed to ESG agendas and they're publishing their performance relative to each of those metrics. Also, also many are committed to planet, purpose and profit, recognising the impact that sustainable investments can have on minimising carbon emissions, maximising social benefits and addressing globally significant social and environmental challenges. We have organisations like the World Economic Forum and the big four accountancy firms collaborating to try to figure out what's the what, what, what can be the common standard for reporting on environmental, social and government issues. With all that activity, it's clear that purpose beyond profit is here to say, to say and it's likely that that's going to be a necessary ingredient for future organisational success. So, to finish off, let me just say a few words now about, um, well, I've just lost my space there, sorry, uh, about ways in which I think that creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship can respond to these, these challenges as we enter the new normal. So I've identified a range of drivers and it's recognised these are pulling and pushing us towards this new normal. Of these drivers, only COVID is recent. Now, of course, COVID has had far reaching impacts, many of which have been devastating. But COVID has also shone a light on all of the other drivers mentioned. And in most cases has accelerated the rate of change and the impact of these. Given this, it's unthinkable that we will return to a pre-COVID normal. Instead, it's widely acknowledged that we are entering a new normal, or an even better phrase, our next normal. And I really wish I'd thought of that for tonight's talk, because I think evolving into that next normal, I really like the, the thought of that. Given the rate of change and the combined impact of COVID and its accelerating effect on other pre-existing trends, it's likely that how we recover into our next normal will greatly benefit from creative thinking, from innovative sol solutions and from entrepreneurial leaders. Now, I've signposted some examples um, where I think we are having a really positive entrepreneur, like we're having positive entrepreneurial responses to these drivers. The human library for me is up there with one of the absolute best and I love the other things that we're doing across our city. So the final few words that I want to speak about um, are why I think entrepreneurial leadership is going to be necessary for organisations across all sectors of all sizes and all locations as we navigate our way into our next normal. If we accept the next, that in the next normal, our workplaces, our society, our planet are going to be different, it's likely that our approach to leading organisations will also have to be different. Now, this in itself is a significant challenge because there are many deeply ingrained norms and expectations associated with how organisations have been and should be led. So, for example, leaders have been trained to hide their vulnerabilities. They've, be, they've been advised to keep their home and their work life separate, despite what might actually be going on in either and the impact that might have. And often when it comes to recruitment and promotion, there's a tendency to hire people who are just like them. In the next normal, research suggests that organisations focused on purpose, organisations that are authentic in their actions, organisations that put people and planet before profit maximization. Organizations that create welcoming, inclusive work cultures 
and organisations that take responsibility for workforce being, well-being, sorry, will be the winners. They will be the winners because they will attract and retain the best talent. They will be more productive, they will be more innovative, they will be more impactful on the world around them because their workforce is happy, contented and feels valued. Now, Accenture have identified a set of key leadership strengths, and I think these are will be really important in our next normal. And I think these map over very nicely to all what the research tells us about entrepreneurial leaders and what my personal experience of working with entrepreneurs over the past 25 years has told me, or taught me, I should say. So in their discussion of life reimagining, re um, Accenture suggests that future leaders will need to be more humane, excellent communicators, truly authentic, and more creative and innovative. So to conclude, a few words on those. To be more humane, what they're talking about here is that they, they believe that leaders will have to have a sense of purpose and be able to connect their employees and their, their, their customers with that sense of purpose. They will be open about their strengths and they will be unafraid of their vulnerabilities. I'm a great fan of Brené Brown, the, the well-known professor of social work at the University of Houston. And she talks about the power of vulnerability. And she argues that vulnerability actually lies at the heart of courageous leaders. In her book, Dare to Lead, Brown draws on more than two decades worth of research to provide a playbook for those of us who dare to lead from the heart rather than from a from a sense of fear and for her being human being humane is central to that the the second skill is that future leaders will be excellent communicators that, who are able to develop emotional connections with their employees with their customers and they're not afraid to admit when they get something wrong thirdly future leaders will be authentic um, i don't know if any of you have seen the the, the the musical Hamilton uh, but, but on a play on a quote made by Alexander Hamilton Accenture say standing for everything means standing for nothing so when we talk about the purpose the benefits of being purpose driven it's really important to have a razor sharp focus on what is distinct and unique about each organization's sense of purpose now, you'll excuse me here, I am going to use my own organisation as an example, because I was trying to think of uh, one, and I I'm so embedded in this, for me, that this, this works well. Strathclyde was established as a place of useful learning, and that sense of providing our students with access to useful education, with society with access to useful research, has endured all the way through to our current ambitions as an internationally recognised technological university and indeed we were the first technological university to be recognised in the UK. Uh, finally Accenture suggests that the future leaders of uh, organisations in the new normal will be creative and innovative. Specifically they suggest that future leaders will shift from co-creating products with their customers to building collaborative ecosystems that encourage the sharing of resources and ideas that invite employees, customers, competitors, regulators, investors, governments to all work together to drive the innovations that are needed to address enduring local challenges such as the Glasgow effect, as well as find solutions to the global challenge of attaining net zero as soon as we possibly can. In Glasgow, the WISE Group provides a great example of an enterprise who's doing that. Their purpose is to lift people out of poverty. How do they do it? They want to build bridges of opportunity for those people, and they achieve that by working with a wide range of partners, including large national businesses, national and local governments, and third sector organisations. Clearly, the last 18 months have been challenging for many of us. And for leaders, COVID has presented almost unimaginable challenges. 
many of which, but for most, will endure. So the, the world's going to look very, very different. So if we can recognize and accept that we are evolving into our next normal, right now, tonight, from today onwards, we have the opportunity to shape that next normal by adopting leadership behaviors, leadership standards, leadership approaches that encourage more inclusive, sustainable organizations that create value for employees, for customers, for organizations, for the environment, and for society at large. Thank you for your time this evening. I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have. I'll, I'll hand over to Ken now to help with this part. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much, Eleanor, for these wise and stirring words, um, particularly towards the end there when you summarized into some really good phrases that we should all keep in mind. Um, there are a few questions and some of them, um, there's a few meaty things coming out here. So I'm going to combine some questions because I was going to um, lead with uh, the questions anyway, Eleanor, if that's okay. Of course, and of course. When you gave the 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 three the three particular areas, the first one of which was um, changing buying habits, and you mentioned what appears to be revival for small towns and successful smart suburbs which um, I think has been recognised. I wondered what you thought about the, the, the situation we have where quite a few um, high streets, even in those small towns, have empty shops. And there seems to be a disconnect with the economic driver of high rents um, for um, either the council or the private owner or high rates which is another issue for small creative companies mm -hmm. who would probably benefit from having a high street presence. What's your view on that? And this whole aspect of working together tends to fall apart a bit when you are faced with, um, we've always done it this way, so we ain't yeah. going to change now. Yeah. How do you position local authorities in that equation? Yeah, brilliant question, Ken. And, and you're absolutely right in, in everything that you're saying now there's no silver bullet to this is, is, is the first thing that I would say uh, but the way we've always done it just ain't going to cut it any any longer you know we, we need to reimagine what we want our high streets and our city centres to look like uh, and with that unfortunately um, th there may be a dawning for local authorities um, and, and I, it'd be great if there's any local authorities um, on, on, on the call th this evening we need to get away of thinking about short short termism. So sure, there may be a reduction in income if we rethink rates and rents, for example. But if we think about the benefits of that, and I don't just mean the economic benefits, I mean the community benefits, the social benefits, the mental health benefits, the well-being benefits. I'm sure there's a lot of pretty smart accountants on this call tonight that could work out what the cost of those intangible benefits would be. And that's the sort of conversation that we need to start having. Um, I, I, I myself grew up in Ayr and I'm appalled, appalled at what's happened, what, it's what South Ayrshire Council have done to, to the high street. We look at Paisley and, and similar things have happened to high streets there. Um, I don't mind one way systems, um, but driving people away from high streets um, isn't helpful. But we, we probably need to reimagine high streets um, as being less retail dependent and much more places for community and civic engagement. Yeah, yeah, thank, thanks very much, Eleanor. Um, I think you will find accountants on this call, whether they're smart or not, I don't know. <laughs> It all depends. It all depends. Now, I'd like to, again, combine some other questions, particularly um, people who are asking about um, retaining the focus on community, social enterprise, public and charitable organisations, alongside the, the, um, the, the much needed support from the private sector. Um, how would you say um, we would see 
um, industry expanding with with the this this whole working together aspect because I find it difficult sometimes to see how charities can get get the true net worth that they clearly contribute and and they get squeezed at every single point of of the the um, supply chain. How do we make sure that those organisations are respected, understood, and given their place in the whole supply chain that you made reference to when we look yeah. at a different way of buying? And this gets back to high streets again, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Ken. And I can also see my good friend Robert McIntosh. I'll get you back. Robert has 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 a quite asked a very similar question in in the chat. Okay, so I think where this takes us to is um, around collaboration and is around the building of ecosystems. And, and if we think actually, if we think less about supply chains and more about ecosystems and we borrow from, I suppose, I don't want to over-intellectualise over anything, but if we borrow from other sciences that look at how other ecosystems thrive and prosper, what they recognise is that the whole ecosystem benefits from the different and varied contributions that that or the varied contributions that different members of that ecosystem contribute to it so again i think we need to reimagine um how we collaborate with one another uh, and i think that was what accenture um ha have drawn our attention to that that there may there's likely to be a shift in this next normal away from supply chains and towards ecosystems so we see this happening already in, in Glasgow so we see um, Glasgow City Innovation District and um, the first in the UK innovation districts are not new there are other amazing innovation districts um, in Spain and in Germany and what we see happening in those innovation districts is a recognition that without those charities those social enterprises those community groups the whole ecosystem fails to work well together so it's a really different way of, of thinking about collaboration but recognizing the, the the various contributions that can made to that that ecosystem and the broader benefits that that will then generate thank you very much i did actually use part of robert mcintosh's question there so um <laughs> i did combine i have to say i hope you're not offended robert in any way um, um i'm going to turn now to um um, Harkley Miller, who is asking a similar question to the one that I asked, but is saying, what would the local government finance mechanism that will ensure that councils drive the outcome of the three things that you mentioned that is best and achieves buy-in and investment from people and businesses? Gosh. Oh, da, 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 That's a really, that. really big question. It is. How long I'm, have you I'm, got? I'm, <laughs> I opened up Hartley's message so I can, I can just read it as well. Sometimes if I read things, I understand them better. It's about it's about um, sponsoring um, creativity and entrepreneurialism for the new high streets. Yeah. Or okay. is it merely a, a facilitator? Okay, so do you know what? Um, I've spoken about ecosystems. Local authorities are part of that ecosystem. They have a place to play. Perhaps the best contribution that local authorities can make is not to stifle or dampen any type of entrepreneurial activity. Okay, so maybe they don't need to be the ones that actually encourage others to, to do it. And they don't need to be the facilitators. There's possibly other organizations that can do that. Perhaps the, 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 the ask of them is, let that flourish. Let that flourish by having reasonable rents and rates, let that flourish by working with regulators to have really good um, support for entrepreneurial organizations. And I mean, entrepreneurial organizations across, you know, from, from social enterprises uh, to, to, to community groups, to um, entrepreneurial ventures that actually have hybrid um, objectives. They, 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 they want to generate money, but they also want to do really good things and, and, and and tackle um, tackle really big problems. So Together Energy out at Clyde Bank would be a brilliant example of an organization doing that. It's trying to provide access to cheap, cheap, reasonable access to renewable energy while at the same time providing job opportunities for young people in that area who have nowhere else to go. 
Um, yeah. So I don't think that we need to rely on local local governments or local authorities to do that. They may not be best placed to do it, but please don't make it difficult. No. Um, Judy Taylor-Smith points out that um, due to lockdown, many people have moved to online shopping using large retailers, and that has meant a big industry explosion for packers, delivery drivers, etc. She's asking, how do you think we can get people to use the high street again and go back to shopping in person to support small businesses? She also points out it's heavy rain in London. Okay. Judy, I'm desperately sorry to hear that it's heavy rain in London. And I'm really sorry to say it's glorious blue skies and very hot and, and sticky in, in my office in Glasgow. But let's never mind that. Um, Judy, I, th I think what we need to do is reframe how we think about high streets so the way high streets are at the moment they're really focused on just retail okay Ju just retail sure there's some restaurants and cafes in there as well but they're predominantly retail what we probably need to do is have greater diversity on our high streets so that they are not just uh, crammed with this you know you could walk down many many city centre high streets and they look I, they look identical. I won't mention the shops, but you know, you see the same shops. I absolutely love it when I go to um, smaller towns, suburbs of Glasgow, and I'm, I come across these brilliant creative organisations and um, independent shops that are offering something different. So I, I think we need greater diversity in our high streets in terms of retail. And I think we need other things to happen in high streets as well. So I was talking about things like, um, could you have community gardens in high streets? Um, could you have social and community space, spaces that provide really safe space for young people to come together? Perhaps tackle loneliness by providing befriending services and bringing older generations together with younger generations and older generations could provide cooking lessons for younger generations and you know it's a win-win I think we just need to have much more diversity um, and that will really help um, get people back into high streets related to that and um, really good infrastructure that allows people to easily and in move around in an environmentally friendly way, really joined up infrastructure. So you have one ticket and it does you, whether you're going by bus, by train, by metro, by underground, things like that. Anything that just makes it easy to travel around um, will be yep. helpful. Also, great coffee anywhere is always, always going to attract people. Absolutely right. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to move on to the last question now. And this question, you could have actually addressed this right at the start, Eleanor, so no pressure. Um, Timothy Purden, the great Timothy Purden, says, are we not in danger of intellectualizing a subject, I take it that's entrepreneurship, that owes more to inspiration and perspective than, than academia. So, Timothy, thank you very much for your question. I see that you posted the question at seven minutes at seven minutes past six. So I'm <laughs> I'm, re I'm reckoning, but by the time we got to six forty five, it, it wasn't overly intellectualizing, I and mean, you had some really hard examples of um, entrepreneurship in action, and, and some great examples of entrepreneurial leadership. Um, I don't believe that. Um, entrepreneurship is ever a subject that can be over intellectualized but I do believe it's a subject that can be massively misunderstood uh, and I hope I've managed to dispel some of those misunderstandings this evening. Yeah I have no, no doubt at all whatsoever that you have Eleanor so um, I'd like to thank you once again for the really enlightening talk and it is quite quite a bizarre situation because we're still in a pandemic and we're still in a situation where we're not actually out of it yet but um the the key aspect is that bizarrely covid could be a, a partner of change um, a concept let's hope it's good change and that we learn from that and um i'd like to thank all the people who are here tonight to listen to this lecture i'm sorry we couldn't we couldn't ask all the questions but um, i think we've got the main ones in to you and it has been recorded and um, we have Eleanor's agreement that it will be on YouTube, um, on, on the Trades House channel on YouTube. And please also um, connect up with Kachina, Eleanor, to have it on the um, universe.
Yes. Sorry, the University absolutely. of Strathclyde site as well. And um, hopefully that will get a few more views. Um, I'm sure you're all wanting to go back. You should know that England won. I think it's 2 0, but um, the um, so there's no need for penalty kicks. So the fact is, um, if you have recorded it, enjoy it. Congratulations to England. And with no further ado, thank you again to Eleanor and um, keep in touch and we'll talk to you soon. And thank you all for attending. Goodbye. Bye. -bye.